This is a test to see if the tape recorder is working. Um, I'm Chris Payton. Today is <coughs> Friday, December uh, 13th, 1996. And I'm here with Mr. and Mrs. Irvin Drake. And if this all works, we will proceed with an interview. <laughs> oh, we'll have honking horns. This happens every time. No I do trumpets, please. No <laughs> trumpets. I've had railroad trains. It's, it's been kind of amazing. <laughs> A friend of mine said there is no such thing as a quiet room. And having done this at this point, I believe in birds. I came back with birds on one recording. That was good. So we're asking everybody as a starter question how they came to know Johnny Mercer. Well, I first knew Johnny Mercer without his knowing me. He was what I refer to as one of my early teachers in the craft of songwriting. You see, when I started, uh, there were no uh, helpful uh, groups that we have nowadays. Um, for instance, nowadays, uh, the Songwriters Guild of America mm -hmm. gives classes in, in songwriting. Uh, so does ASCAP, so does BMI, so does the Songwriters Hall of Fame. I'm on the board of that organization, and I know very well how active it is in that area, too. I'm on the board also of the uh, Songwriters Guild of America, etc. But nowadays, we do believe that, that you may shortcut the, develop, the, the um, time of development and, and maturity to ultimate fruition of, of an acknowledged writer by giving instruction and discussing things. And where uh, a group of peers of that young writer will sit around and very freely criticize, sharply criticize, maybe even offer suggestions as how to go, and slowly there's a roundness that emerges. And as a result of this, people who came out of it, for instance, were people like Kandrin Ebb, who wrote Cabaret for Broadway, and Bach and Harnick, who did Fiddler on the Roof. BMI was very early in their development. Um, and what I had at that time, and what all of us had, were the examples set by writers of our time. We could take either the more commercial Tin Pan Alley form, or we could take the very bright young talents that were coming along, like Johnny Mercer. Prior to Mercy, it was Rogers and Hart and Cole Porter and the Gershwins that I listened to. But when Mercy came along with a totally different bent, I recognized that instantly you could not help. You could hear the humor in, pardon my southern accent, I love y'all. And um, you could hear it in Lazy Bones, Lying on the sh sh uh, Shade, and etc. And you really, which was his first mammoth hit. And you recognize that this was an authentic voice, not only of the South, but of humanity. And um, as I say, I learned a lot from, on behalf of the visiting fireman and Bob White and Weekend of a Private Secretary, prior to his great, to the great ballads that he wrote, like Dream and Moon River and all those other things, which won him many awards. That was my first meeting with Johnny Mercer, the meeting in wi which did not take place on his part, only on mine. The next time that I actually saw the man in any kind of action was in a, um, in a restaurant called Jack Dempsey's. That great prize fighter used to sit in the window <laughs> so that people would see him and come in. But uh, it was a place that um, music types, uh, publishers, song pluggers in those days, songwriters would come down there and we had a watering hole around the bar in New York, that's right, in Tin oh, Pan Alley, was then called the Brill, the Brill Building. Mm -hmm. was, uh, incidentally, the, the ground underneath the Brill Building is owned by the Crown of, the, of England. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. They owned a lot of territory here. It doesn't matter that we th threw them out originally, they came back and bought it up. Uh, about what year was this? This or was, it must have been about 48, 49, or 50, right around that time. And I remember seeing, somebody said to me, hey, there's Johnny Mercer. I said, where? The fellow with, the, uh, with that hat. I said, oh, oh, that coconut looking straw hat, that color, with a wide, puggery, flamboyantly colored band. They said, that's, I said, gee, that's, wow. <laughs> now, none of us had the temerity to go over and say hello. He would, knowing him later on, he would have loved it. And, and we would have told him how much he meant to us and how he had freed us from so many of the proscriptions of publishers all those years, all the things we were forbidden to express. Because he brought along a conversational, a uh, the man on the street approach 
Although, of course, in his case, the man on the street was endowed with a much greater imagery and, and, and resource of imagery and, and the language, which was always true to what he was saying. He never went astray. Everything was right on the nose for what he was going for. And yet, surprising, he, he pulled his little surprises on the way. And uh, I've always felt that Frank Lesser, who was there at the same time, but I've always felt that Frank Lesser was greatly influenced by Johnny Mercer in his first years, and that when Frank wrote uh, so a, st a song like um, Small Fry with Hoagy Carmichael, incidentally one of uh, uh, Johnny's uh, first collaborators, that it was in a sense engendered by Frank, who did not come out of the South. Frank came out of New York City. And that kind of talk is something I think he picked up because of John. Uh, but they were both great writers, and they were later to work together it, it, when, when Johnny recorded some of Frank's material. Uh, in any case, that, as I say, again, was a first, a first sighting of the great man on my part. But it was to be some time before I were actually to, to meet him. Uh, then I became aware of the fact that um, he and Buddy De Silva, another great songwriter, but who chose to become head of Paramount Pictures, got together with a, um, a marketing expert who owned his own shop uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles, his own record shop, Glenn Wallace, and the three of them got together and, and uh, formed uh, Capitol Records. And Johnny was, I think he had the first hit recording uh, of Capitol Records. Um, he was writing like crazy, and then he wrote G.I. Jive, which was a hit for them, and um, oh, many, many, many others. And later on, accentuate the positive, and generally he recorded his songs first. He also very unselfishly recorded the work of others, like Johnny Burke, and uh, who wrote a great deal like Frank, although f uh, uh, like Johnny, I mean, although not from the Southern perspective at all. Now, I don't want to lab belabor the the Southern part because. Johnny was cosmopolitan, and though he had that as a major resource, as his own ethnic bag, uh, he was a world figure. Um, and when he did Johnny Burke's personality, you could have sworn that Johnny had written, or that was written especially for him. Uh, it was the same kind of, of conversational writing. I, I knew Johnny Burke, too. Um, so that I got to reveal that, and there was a time I found early on that Johnny almost recorded a song of mine before I'd even seen him anywhere. It was brought to him by a man named Enoch Light, who fell in love with the song I wrote called There Are No Restricted Signs in Heaven. I'm mentioning this because I want to show you Mercer's bent as, as a human being. And uh, it's a story about uh, people waiting online at the gates of heaven to be admitted. And uh, I wrote this in a conversational way, having been influenced by the great Mr. Mercer. And I wanted to reach all the people, because I felt I had a message worth telling. And I didn't want it to seem a message. So I did it with a boogie-woogie tempo and very conversationally. And I referred to things in it like wearing jeans, that, that kind of thing, in, in 1945. And uh, Johnny fell in love with the song where Enoch showed it to him. I didn't even know he'd shown it to him and said he wanted to record it. And to um, uh, give you an idea, it, it started with knock a knock a knock 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 knock. Folks were knocking at the pearly gates. Knock a knock a knock 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 knock. Ask him about the rooms and about the rates. Old St. Peter, official greeter, he was present to let him in. A few looked down because their skin was brown. But Pete, he hollered with a great big grin, welcome, welcome. There are no restricted signs up in heaven. There's no selected clientele, and so forth. Johnny thought that was a wonderful thing, and he wanted to record it. Then Enoch called me sometime later in and he said, I'm sorry, Irvin, Johnny can't record it. I said, I said, what? He said, well, I'd shown him restricted sign. I said, you didn't tell me that. No, I wanted to try to get it first before telling you. I said, well, why couldn't he? He said, well, he showed it to his partner, Glenn Wallach, who is a businessman. And Glenn said to him, John, the way things are in this country, if you record that song, we're a brand new company we will lose our total Southern distributorship, and that will be the end of Capitol Records. Now, were that today, Mr. Mercer would not have been told that or wouldn't have paid it any mind. At that time, it was life or death for a, a new company, and he couldn't do it. 
but that was almost meeting him because he, he met me that, mm -hmm. through, that, through that song. But he was very interested in writers. He was a very generous man. The mere fact that he sought other writers' material, he didn't try to keep the whole thing under his hat the way singer writers do these days. Today they're vertical structures, not Johnny Mercer. Johnny was a world type. He wanted everything that was good. He was for it. If it wasn't good, and he wrote about that in a poem uh, later on, he set forth his m part of his own philosophy of life and this planet. But in any case, uh, I was upset about that, but then the Golden Gate Quartet did it, and, and, uh, and they did get out of the world. Um, I mentioned his generosity to other writers. At one time, um, he wrote me a letter in which he said, I'm sitting here. He said, I've been trying to do some writing, but I also had the um, radio on, and uh, one of our local stations is playing Perry Como recording of Father of Girls, which you wrote. He said, it's a wonderful song. He said, I really love it. I had to let you know, J.M. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you don't get that. Uh, for instance, <laughs> Frank Lesser had a little more competition in him. Uh, when a show of mine, What Makes Sammy Run, opened, and I had one of the songs I had, and it was called Room Without Windows, Room Without Windows, and Room Without Doors, and so forth and so on. I got a call from Frank, and he said, uh, I said, hi there. He said, about that uh, song of yours, A Room Without Windows. I said, yes. He said, where were you raised? In a billiard academy? <laughs> I see, now Johnny could never have brought himself to say. He would have said, gee, I'm sorry, I never thought of it. As a matter of fact, Cole Porter, we, and I had the same publisher at that time. And he told the publisher that in his, that he was then an ailing man. He, he, was, he was not going to be with us for more than another year. And he said to him, this Mr. Herman Starr, he said, Herman, you know, I've had a feeling that if I were active right now, I might have writ written that song. So you can see that there were certain people who were above that kind of competitive thing uh, that, uh, that human beings have for each other. They, they were um, satisfied to be themselves, do what they did, each move in his or her own orbit, and recognize the good that surrounded them coming from others. Um, another thing that Johnny did once, uh, I, I think this was engendered by the fact that when I was in his home one night and he'd, <laughs> he'd gotten a little, you know, the three sheets to the wind and um, he, <laughs> he abruptly left the dinner table, leaving Ginger and <laughs> me together, and he went off to the bedroom <laughs> to sack out. <laughs> <And> <laughs> So I, I was going home shortly thereafter, and I'd been home about a month when I got a big package. And it just said, uh, Johnny Mercer, Shalon Drive, Bel Air. So. And I opened it up, and said, what could this be about? And it was a book of drawings. I had told him. Now, he never told me. That's another, I mean, he was, he was a modest person, to the, I mean, to to a ridiculous extent. When I had told him that I'd been a functioning cartoonist and I'd studied art, uh, I'd studied painting and etching and lithography and all that, uh, drawing from the cast and drawing from the anatomy and all, all the human anatomy, all that, he never once said to me that he had this intuitive, because he didn't study it, this intuitive ability. And I later was aware of some of his watercolors and they were simply wonderful. Uh, the mere fact that he expressed that without academic information is incredible. But then he had no academic information when he started writing songs. Uh, so he had never mentioned that, but he was aware of me. So he wrote, Dear Irvin, um, in recognition of your many talents, uh, I thought you'd enjoy this book. It's a book of caricatures by David Levine, and I know that you're going to find as, as much in it as I have. He said, by the way, I had to go foraging through, he said when I was in New York last, I had to go uh, foraging through uh, some of the warehouses on the other side of the Hudson River in Hoboken looking for remaindered copies of this book because the publisher no longer had it in stock. But I found it. Imagine the trouble that man went to. And I thought to myself, part of it was because he left the dinner in the middle and his Savannah hospitality couldn't live with that. I, I found that most, most interesting. How did you get to know him better? You said that you first met when you, you sent him a song and he liked oh, it. Well, 
Uh, at that time, uh, this was in the uh, early and middle 70s. I got to know him much better because, um, well, actually I'd known him because he tweeted me when I was in, in his home and I think it was 1968, and I had a show, I'd mentioned What Makes Sammy Run, which ran for a few years, but I didn't mention uh, something called Her First Roman, which I did, a, an adaptation of the Bernard Shaw uh, classic Caesar and Cleopatra. I had done the adaptation of the book and the, and the score, and the Shaw estate was wi wild about what I had done, or they wouldn't let me proceed with it, because they were very strict in their control. Nonetheless, th there are these funny things that happen in the course of, of the presentation of a musical, which is like, Presenting a musical is like uh, building a, 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 an aircraft carrier. <laughs> I mean, it's that complex, and then you hope it's going to float and the planes can get off and, and, and return safely as a result of what you've done. And putting together a musical has all of those pitfalls. When you, as, it's not when you're working by yourself or with a collaborator or so. It's when you start getting involved with a first director and a second director and a first choreographer and a second choreographer and a nervous producer and, and the, the sets that stick and, or don't fit the theater, uh, th all those things and a first night audience out of town uh, that's seeing it before you've had a run through <laughs> and the out of town critics were angry because they're expecting you to be in ship shape ready for, for them. So it, w with all these alibis I'm giving you it comes the fact that it failed. It ran just three weeks. So when I <laughs> saw Johnny the next time, he started kidding me about it. And I said to him, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's review your record on Broadway. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, sometimes he said, I have a feeling that I'm just not cut out for Broadway. I don't know if anybody else has told you about this. But he said, he said I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, it's a very special kind of writing for Broadway, something that Alan J. Lerner has, and something that Steve Sondheim has, because he was very aware of who was on the landscape. He said, I don't know that I have that. I, I'm okay for songs by themselves, for, for movies, but what has developed in the theater is quite different from when I first came around to the theater. And I don't know that uh, I should really be trying so hard, but he did, and he certainly had a big hit in Lil Abner. <laughs> and, and, um, and he had, I mean, the work that he did, that he and Harold Arlen did for um, uh, St. Louis Woman is one of the greatest uh, scores you'll find in Broadway. Things like Come Rain, Come Shine, and, and uh, uh, I forget what it was, the Pearl Belly. It's uh, a woman's prerogative. That's right, that a woman's prerogative, that, right. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely, yes. It was, it was, it was kind of early expression of that. And... Um, so, I mean, he really, <laughs> but he, he couldn't get, because he had that mischievous side too, which, I mean, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. There's got to be a little slyness, a little putting other people on, and he could do that, but without really meaning to hurt. He was, he was not a hurtful person. And, um, but then I, uh, I got to know him, more, but that was in his own home too, and I got to really know him uh, in the course of meetings of the council of the uh, American Guild of Authors and Composers, AGAC. I would come out, I would visit uh, a couple of times a year just to be with the West Coast Council. Uh, it was while I was president that we had enlarged, formally we didn't have a council in the West Coast. And I insisted that we divide the country up and I anticipated that Nashville would become part of the picture in years to come. And I insisted that we reserve a, a, a Nashville seat as well as several West Coast seats and New York seats. But Johnny was on the council. About and when was this? Uh, this was in early 70s, okay. 73, yeah. 74, 75. So I'd see him there. But I will tell you this. He was remarkably quiet during those meetings. He, he did not particularly like any kind of business. Even the transaction of business about songs and, and our discussion about publishers, our discussion about the copyright for that, he didn't feel that the Guild was qualified to get into the copyright fight. He said, no, he trusted ASCAP, and that I feel that ASCAP should take care of that. And we had a disagreement on that. And, uh, but that was okay. It was a, fortunately, fellows like Henry Mancini did see it my way, and Johnny Green, and they came into Washington with me. So did U.B. Blake, Marvin Hamlish, and people like that. But John was conservative, and he knew the way the structure had been since he first got in. He was an early member of ASCAP. 
and he trusted it completely, trusted the then president Stanley Adams and wanted nothing to interfere with what Stanley saw as his jurisdiction, his bailiwick. Uh, but they were only friendly disagreements. You didn't have hateful things with Johnny Mercer. He it, it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of human being. And uh, I learned to love Ginger Mercer. Mm -hmm. She was a very proper lady. It's hard in retrospect, you know, she never discussed her early days about having been a chorus girl, an actress on Broadway, and, and outgoing, and then becoming uh, almost like um, almost like an early Puritan, you know. She was really a very proper, circumspect woman. And I will say this, that when John finally left us, she guarded, she protected his memory. And, and she thought that uh, the foundation, the John Emerson Foundation, was a, a really important thing to construct so that what he achieved in his lifetime could be bestowed upon those who were less fortunate and uh, and well, were the institutions and she was very she was remarkable in her instincts about that and really saw it through and I have to admire I have to admire John's choice of a life partner mm -hmm. as well as hers uh, but in those years I, I really did get to, to to know John even even better before that we had been songwriters kind of kicking around and uh, you know. Did like you ever, that. he was mostly in Los Angeles, but he was sometimes in New York. Did you ever yeah. see him when he was in New York? Ever go yeah, when he, was in, when he was in, when he was in, when he was in, when he was in on, uh, on Saratoga. Mm -hmm. um, I saw him then, uh, I'd seen him a couple of times before. He was sometimes also in, not having to do with a show. And uh, we did, uh, we did see each other, and yes. Um, but we're, you know, everybody's busy doing his or her own thing, and uh, so you, you didn't get too clannish. I was in, in their uh, Park Avenue apartment on a couple of occasions with them, and um, uh, <laughs> he, he referred once to the fact that, uh, I forget what the, what the line was now, but about the place being so small. I, I've, I've heard uh, somebody told me that it was oh, yeah. fairly small. Yeah, right, yes, it was. And gloomy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. They lit it up, but the place itself was a bit gloomy. But it was only a pied a terre for them when they were in town, mm -hmm. which was not that much of the year. Right. And it was situated beautifully, and there is whenever they wished it. Um, there would have been no sense having a, a townhouse here. Mm -hmm. um, Let me ask you something. You mentioned that you were involved with the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Yeah. Were you involved at all at the time it was just founding? Because we, we were given to understand that Mercer was very much involved in, in or very promoted that very much. Oh, indeed. Around 1970? He was, was one of three people. Out. He was one of three people who put it together. He and a publisher named Abe Ullman and another publisher named Howie Richmond. Howie is still with us. He's, he's the one who survives. Um, and uh, three purposeful, honorable men uh, who had a very good idea. And, uh, but you see, again, Johnny was not a fellow for presiding over businesses, and he viewed this also as business, and he couldn't wait. After a few years, he called upon Sammy Khan, because he knew that Sammy did have that bent, and he knew that he'd be good for, um, for uh, making the, uh, making the the uh, Hall of Fame advance for for making it larger and and getting ultimately getting a museum for it. The the grim joke is that we still don't have a physical museum. Nonetheless, uh, Sammy was a, a good choice. Although, see, John did not run in an autocratic way. He did in a very hands-off way. Sammy was he was the autocrat of the breakfast table, the lunch table, and the dinner table. And I had run-ins. I never had a run-in with John. I had run-ins with Sammy many, many times. I mean, <laughs> sparks used to fly. <laughs> Margaret Whiting was once present during one of them. She thought she thought we'd take the fists. <laughs> I said, "I said you don't know songwriters. We fight with words." <laughs> but um, Johnny was present only, I think, four or five years, and then Sammy 
and we're bored. Um, was there some other part of the question? No, we were just a little bit yeah. curious about it. I must tell you a story that um, he once told me. Uh, oh, wait, first of all, I want to tell you, I re referred before as that mischievous and sly sense of humor. Now, uh, despite being a giving man, he was human. And he had written a lyric to uh, a tune for a film. And they didn't tell him they were making a sweepstakes out of this. They were submitting it to other lyric writers. I don't know if anybody has referred to this. No. Well, <laughs> this was in his home, he said. And it was a song that came out to, and came to be known as The Shadow of Your Smile. I don't think he loved the fact that somebody else he probably felt he had a much better lyric, though I don't know what his lyric was. And he said uh, to me, uh, by the way, the shadow of your smile, doesn't that kind of suggest the faint mustache on a lady's lip? <laughs> That's how he got even. <laughs> he told me a story about an early story about uh, when he was a kid in New York. He's about 17 years old. And um, he had always liked that when he was a kid in Savannah. And he could accompany himself. And uh, he told me about uh, coming across Charles K. Harris, a famous old songwriter. Charles K. Harris was an industrious writer. He had his own little printing plan. He sold, I mean, he didn't entrust anything to anybody else. He took care of everything. So Johnny once got an appointment, went over to see Charles K. Harris at his office. And he said, uh, Mr. Harris, I, I love your song, After the Ball. He said, uh, and uh, Harris said, would, would you like to have a copy? He said, oh, I'd love to have a copy. He said, well, sure, I'll get one right here. He said, uh, and, and with that, he, he cranked out a copy. <laughs> he printed it for Charlie. And then uh, he said, would you like me to autograph for you? Oh, Mr. Harris, I would treasure that. And so he autographed for her. He handed it to me and said, that would be two dollars, please. <laughs> um, among the, uh, talking about the younger songwriters that he, he was uh, individually counseling two different people. Uh, a young one named Marilyn Keith and a young man named Alan Bergman. And he was intuitive, certainly. You can tell that by his lyrics. And it occurred to him that they would make a wonderful team. And so he, uh, he put them together. And then they got married later on. And they're now known as the Bergmans. And Marilyn Keith Bergman now sits as the uh, uh, president and, and uh, CEO of ASCAP. And Alan, her consort, they still write together actively. And it's been a, a, it was a wonderful marriage. He, John didn't just make a marriage between words and music, he also did it between people. Um, I'm gonna turn this over. Sure. So we can pause just a minute. Okay. Oh, I must mention that this is, this is a piece of silliness on my part, but <laughs> I thought it was, I'm a golfer. <laughs> Not a great golfer, but a golfer. And I couldn't help but notice when I sat on the veranda with them that the Bel Air Country Club had this wonderful golf course. I, I don't remember which hole it was, but one of them, the, the tee, was just below the Mercer's home. And if anybody shanked a shot, <laughs> the ball would invariably wind up either breaking a window or at least resting on the floor of the terrace. We had to duck a couple of them when we sat there. But they took a very good humor. That was part of it. They had to have anticipated that before they moved in. They, they knew. They just hoped that the level of golfing would pick up over the years. But they were, it was amazing. All the golf balls lay around there. They could, you know, he was supplied for a year. He never mentioned whether he was much of a golfer himself. He never, never told me that. We have a caricature. It's in the exhibit, and you'll have to look. And it's the drawing of him, and then people have drawn him doing different things, yes. singing and songwriting, whatever, and, and there's a picture of him golfing, and the little caption under it, I think, is something like, hold still ball, or something like that. <laughs> did so he, he drew that? No, he didn't. Somebody, oh, oh. somebody did it for I him. I see. And I think he said that Margaret's father he was great. tried to get him into golf. Richard Whiting was a great golfer. That's something else. He played, he was almost scratch. He played in the low 70s. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different kind of talent. I don't have that. For me, it was a feat several times in my life when I broke 90, okay? Now you get the level of my game. But uh, I don't think Johnny had that kind of um, lust. <laughs> Golfing, I think, was something eluded him. 
Um, he talks in his autobiography a little bit about, you know, uh-huh. there's a few comments in there, but the comment that stood out most to us was that, based on the success of Two Marvelous for Words, that he and Richard Whiting felt confident enough to sit around the pool and throw rocks at the blackbirds, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, which bothered Mr. Whiting a lot. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, kind of be comfortable. Attend parties and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, but Richard Whiting was he was a great golfer. I mean, that's it, which he probably started. Oh, in I Detroit. know. There's a story that Mr. Whiting dropped a firecracker behind Johnny when he was teeing off. He did those things all the time. Yeah, that was a gotcha. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, we hate gotchas in golf. <laughs> and uh, I, I never knew Richard Whiting, uh, but sounds uh, like he was a real sketch. Huh? He sounds like he was a real sketch. Oh yeah, yeah. But I, I've never gone for the uh, practical joke. I, I, I this. I feel there's a little hostility in, in practical joke. Um, Mercer said he gave Ginger a pipe. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I wonder what kind of comment that was. <laughs> yeah, we, sh- we shall not touch it. <laughs> we will not touch it. Right. Just accept it as fact. Um, I'll tell you one thing, one dramatic moment in my life, uh, touching on my late friend, was when I was in the, on the West Coast uh, about 1975, I think it was the early summer, um, I held a meeting at the home of one of our members of one of our West Coast Council uh, officers. I think he was vice president of the West Coast, John Green, who wrote Body and Soul and many, many others, Coquette. Uh, Gee, I'm, I'm at a loss now, but I Cover the Waterfront was another one, Easy Come, Easy Go. He, he wrote a lot, lot of wonderful, wonderful songs, which he kind of gave up his own song, his own compositional activity by um, becoming head of music for, for MGM. And, um, and he loved that life, and he, he loved scoring the various films. Of course, he did great scoring one of the, uh, Rain Tree County he did a scoring for and, and he did Oliver over in, over in London. He, he really, Johnny was cut out for that, I mean Johnny Green was cut out for that. And uh, oh, Johnny Green hated it. If, you, if I said to him, as I did once or twice, I said, uh, pardon me, uh, which way is the John? He said, don't ever refer to that room by my name. <laughs> Mercer would never have said that. <laughs> anyway, we're at this meeting and I had noted that uh, Merce was unusually quiet. He was there with Ginger, and I conducted this meeting, and they were, there was uh, a lot of stuff on, on, to accomplish, and it was at this point that I was pushing so heavily, uh, getting the guild, which had never been politically motivated, into uh, trips we were to ultimately make down to Washington. Um, which needed funding, and for that I'd gone to Richard Rogers. And when I thanked Mr. R- R- Rogers for giving me the time and the money, he's he w- at that point uh, Richard Rogers had had a laryngectomy, and he could only whisper. And he leaned forward and he said, "No, thank you." He understood what we were about to do, and he was not tied down to those feelings that Johnny and Hoagy Carmichael had about ASCAP being the whole thing and the estate of, uh, of Otto Harbach, who had been president of ASCAP, and of William Hammerstein, uh, of, 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 pardon me, of Oscar Hammerstein, uh, his son Billy, who was a friend of mine. They all pitched in and they were the first, they were the beginning of that. And I tried to get uh, a total uh, support from the West Coast. I got it from fellows like Ray Evans and Jay Livingston and Jack Lawrence, who then lived out there. We had them all into New York and, and to Washington, D.C. Rob, later on. Uh, trying to get that bill through, and we were successful in '76. We got the new copyright law, and but but Johnny h- held firm to his steadfast relationship with then President Adams, and uh, but that was okay. That was simply a, a, a difference of philosophy. But as we get uh, rose to leave Mr. Green's home, he and Bonnie's home. Uh, I started toward the door. Johnny got up with Ginger, and he took a couple of steps forward, and then he pitched forward. And fortunately, I have a very fast response, and I caught him before he hit the floor. But it it didn't seem like a normal. It didn't. He hadn't tripped. He just felt. And then I hung back, and he got in, and he excused himself and said nothing at all, and and uh, he tried to make nothing of it. 
And then he and Ginger left, and I followed. And then he leaned against a tree, and I heard him say to Ginger, gee, I, I feel awfully sick. I, I don't know what this is. And I left, and I still didn't know what it could possibly be. I don't, because, you know, things like high blood pressure can produce that kind of thing. There's so many things. I had no idea it was symptomatic of the one dread thing that he suffered from, and that was to kill that great mind. I mean, after all, he was only 66. He had so much more to give the world in every way. And uh, I hated that as a, uh, as a goodbye. I really did. Did you see him much after that? No. This, not this really. would have been not too long before he had surgery, then. No, and then later on in 76, I was part of a group. I spoke at a theater in New York. I forget which one now, but there was a whole big group of fellows like, well, all of us turned out for it. And, uh, and as president of the Guild, I, I spoke, and as a friend, and uh, I think I'm pretty sure Carl Rowan spoke at that time. He made a wonderful statement about growing up and the influence that Mercer's songs had on him. And um, This was the memorial service? That yeah, that's held. right, yes, right. Jimmy Rolls was there. He played and he, he had written that thing with Johnny about that type, that, uh, that lion. Uh, Frazier. Frazier, yeah. And, um, and there was uh, gee, a man who was a, a real chronicler of Tin Pan Alley and show music. Alec Wilder mm -hmm. was there. And uh, so it was, it was quite a group of, of knowing writers and so forth. And it was a touching thing because you knew this was not just a tribute, that everybody there had been touched by Johnny Mercer and wanted to impart that love, express it as if, as if it was, as if he himself was on hand, was palpably there, and they were telling him that. And uh, I guess a lot of people who believe in those things believe that he was there. Uh, in any case, that was the last time, in a sense, I saw Johnny. Mm -hmm. So you didn't s visit the house or anything when, when after they moved him home from the hospital? No. The, apparently there were very few people. Bill Harbach no. appears to yeah, be, well that, and yeah, well Mrs. Mercer's, well who Billy became... Red Kramer, who became Mrs. Mercer's friend later, apparently yeah. visited a little bit. Mark, yeah. yeah. We saw a lot of Mark and Ginger mm -hmm. in, in the ensuing years. Um, and you know, we did a lot of talking, you know, mm -hmm. about Johnny. Oh, there were other subjects, but a lot of, about Johnny and also about what could be done about the image and so forth. And I'm not only for the image of Johnny Mercer, but I feel that with his pa passage, his departure, as that of Cole Porter, and Rogers and Hart and Hammerstein and Kern and Berlin and all those people, we've lost a terribly important part of musical history in this country. Um, I do believe that the pop song in their time uh, is becoming the classic music of our, of our country and of the world. Um, uh, I'm not sure that what has followed it uh, will have that same kind of lasting quality. Um, but I do hope that that kind of music stays in our memory and in our lives so that we never lose what Johnny Mercer and his contemporaries contributed. And that's why I'm a part of the Johnny Mercer Foundation mm -hmm. and trying in every way to see to it that this is perpetuated. I think it's, it's remarkably important. I think it's it's holding, it's a um, it's being entrusted with a certain responsibility to hold the floodgates against the barbarians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be very unpopular with people who think that there is only progress as things go on, and that the, the, those of us who they see as hanging back and clinging to to a past, that doesn't disturb me at all. That is really the way I feel. I have a question for you that's that's different than questions than we've asked other people, and you, you may not have an answer, but we've been noticing more and more over the years as we become more and more familiar with, with Mercer's lyrics how very, very good it, he was at writing the woman's point of view. Margaret has used some of these in her work, but you've got a woman's prerogative. Yes. 
he didn't have the know-how know-how, which was a title that I had forgotten until we had to find something for somebody, and that turned out. Did he? I wrote a song called Know How Also. Really? Yes, it was used on television on a special. Oh, oh, it was in when when uh, they presented the Broadway show High Button Shoes, the score of which had been written by uh, Sammy Kahn and Julie Stein. Um, because the sponsor was somebody called, I, I think it was the Buick or Oldsmobile division of GM, and they had a song and they called Model T Ford, and they said, we can't use that. They said to me, would you write a song? I wrote a song called Know How that was performed by uh, Hal March and Joey Fay. And uh, they did it beautifully. It was, but I had no idea that. Well, it's not quite know how. It's he didn't have the know how. Know oh, how. mine was know how. Yeah, this this You're has a little, little more to do it. Yeah. Well, this man wasn't evidently. I see. Um, right. And then uh, well, you see, Margaret's that was, using uh, one. That was his mischievous approach. Oh yes. <laughs> right. Oh yes. Margaret's using one in her shows called "I Fought Every Step of the Way." Oh yes. It's quite wonderful. Oh yes. And then we've been sorting through the the copies of things that came yeah. in, in part two, and there's a whole series called Celia's Lament, mm -hmm. and then Celia's, there are three parts to it, I can't remember the first one, but the S Celia's Consternation is one of them, mm -hmm. Celia's, I think it's Supplication, Celia's Desperation, and this is all over a woman who's desperately wishing to lose her virginity, <laughs> and first she realizes the pickle she's in because she still has it, and men don't want women who have it, except they do want women who have it, oh. so that's the consternation. And then she prays for assistance with this, and then there's desperation that follows. Yes. Um, and we've <laughs> and, just been And there's noticing. no divine intervention in this project. Well, I don't know. I think it might be from Foxy. I haven't figured out exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's clearly from something, and so mm -hmm. there's, there's obviously more to the story. Um, but we've just been noticing how very well that he captures, in, sometimes in silly ways and mischievous ways, and sometimes in more serious ways, the woman's point of view. And just we've been kind of fooling around with this and wondering if anybody, you for instance as a songwriter and someone who knew him, might have any insight into how he came to have this understanding. Well, even, even the humorous songs, I uh, mean there's there's some depth underneath there. I would there. think that any writer of real talent, unless severely constricted with certain social, with warped social attitudes, would have to feel the universality of the male and female uh, point of view, uh, even though they, you know, that uh, women are from Venus and men are from Va Mars, I think there's, uh, and, I, uh, and a lot of people who do a little heavier thinking than I do by custom, uh, feel also that there's an awful lot of Venus in the men and an awful lot of Mars in the women. So that you're writing, and when Mercer wrote a thing like Days of Wine and Roses, I mean, he's making a statement that either a man or a woman can make. And it was made for a film in which there was a double problem, wasn't there, between mm -hmm. the man and the woman uh, yes. when it came to alcoholism, something he knew something about. Um, so I think that uh, uh, unless he were called upon to write, make a real woman statement, it may simply be that the shows that he had to write for had women who had issues to express. And that for, being for very good, good at expressing issues. For good reason, because Broadway, as far back as I can recall in the m musical form, relies upon more heavily upon the female star than upon the male star. And therefore, there you are sitting with that. I mean, when Alan Lerner wrote um, uh, words, 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 and goes into uh, uh, tell me, uh, that, that's that's a female thing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it just you wait, Henry Higgins, just you wait, and and oh, because of the blindness and intransigence of that man, Henry Higgins, and and her feeling at first inferior and then rising to it and then telling him off, even though in his absence. Um, so, th uh, and and I think Hammerstein has dealt with that also. Uh, uh, um, when Ellie Forbush sang in South Pacific about, uh, well, not just I'm going to get that man right out of my hair, but more subtly, at another point, or, well, or, or in The King and I, when Anna Leon Owens sings about, uh, and, and when one of, the, uh, um, uh, one of the King's wives sing about him, uh, when she sings, uh, Hello, Young Lovers, I've Had a Love Like You. Uh, yes. 
and and then the and then the one of the Korean wives said, and then he'll do something wonderful. Mm -hmm. She sees him for what he is. Right. So all of these people um, understand it from both ends of it. And look at a remarkable writer like Dorothy Fields, who took the other side and could write from a man's point of view. You know, I think that truly talented people, mm -hmm. uh, they must be endowed with sensibility and sensitivity and instinct. Just the, the intuitive quality that I attributed to Mercer earlier uh, is there and will not be denied and given the opportunity will be expressed. Mm -hmm. And certainly as one of our greatest practitioners, he expressed it very beautifully. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I need to be absolutely sure I get you to lunch on time. So we'll need to stop here okay. for this session. Mm -hmm. but I want to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. It's and really my pleasure to talk about Johnny Mercer. Look forward perhaps to speaking again in the future. You bet. Thank you.